This is a production of Cornell University. Uh, thanks, everybody. This is the uh, 18th episode of the Cornell Turf Show this spring. Uh, happy to have a guest, Dr. Ben McGraw, the Penn State University. We've got a bunch of Penn State guests here, Frank, in the last couple of weeks. Uh, <laughs> we don't know how we feel about that, but uh, we're excited to have Ben on today to talk about, I'm sure, annual bluegrass, weevil, crane flies, we'll, we'll talk about a whole um, host of bugs here. Um, but uh, a quick announcement for everybody. Uh, Frank and I are going to extend this uh, Turf Show series one extra week for everybody. It's the old buy 10, get one free. Uh, everybody's really enjoyed these things. So we're, we're going to go one more week for our live audience. And of course, you'll be able to get that uh, on, on video or podcast as well. But um, as always, we'll start out. Frank, uh, lead us off here. Uh, okay, Carl. <laughs> Thanks very much. It's so great to be here. Uh, hi to everyone. Thanks for Ben and 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 big shout out to Nelson Karen and 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 absolutely what looked like a gem. I don't know the rest of the golf course, but the holes I saw along the shore. It's the first good look. I really took the time to take a look at Seminole and absolutely spectacular venue. Of course, uh, you know with uh, Gil's hand, Gil Hans's hands on a good Cornell grad there, uh, helping make a great golf course better. So uh, Tom Feller out in in Cedar Rapids, Iowa, celebrating his grandson coming to the golf course. Uh, so exciting when everybody can share uh, the passion of, of taking care of the land and the course with their family. And then, of course, this was the week of broken stuff, right? I, I, I had as many mower broken pictures and pictures as I've seen anywhere. And I love the picture on the right that came with the caption, uh, irrigation parts for sale, some assembly required. I just uh, I love seeing that stuff. And then I couldn't help but chuckle uh, recently. I've been getting around the state again as people start moving out of New York City uh, and into the rest of the part of the state. Um, you know, most of us think of, you know, downstate, anything south of that Pennsylvania, northern Pennsylvania border. I know you must be from New York City. But I can tell you just, you know, from as a downstate person also, if you're from Westchester County, you're from upstate. So uh, it's a very different perspective. And I love the Western New York. They don't even call it soda. Uh, they call it pop. That was a big learning thing for me. Uh, shout out to John Hoyle at Corning Country Club uh, doing tree work, right? I know Gary Player shooting his mouth off these days uh, saying, man, we need all these trees. And I just want you to focus in this lovely before and after picture that John took. You know, what's wrong with seeing your golf course, right? I don't see what's wrong with actually seeing your golf course, right? And presumably this isn't a safety hazard or, or that sort of thing, you know, but, but, you know, I don't see what's wrong with being able to see your golf course. And in the news, we can tell uh, Jim Brosnan out in Tennessee and Matt Elmore down at Rutgers, uh, you know, they all got together and, and each year vote on, you know, it's like the Academy Awards or something for weed scientists. And, and this year, uh, the survey of grass, crops, uh, pasture, and turf released their most troublesome and most common weeds uh, that they find there. And, and you can see crabgrass, dandelion at the top, annual bluegrass, both in most common and most troublesome. And most troublesome uh, where is where it's difficult to control. So you can see clover doesn't necessarily transfer over because it's generally perceived as, and dandelion re generally perceived as relatively easy to control. All right, Carl, here we are again with our environmental research program update with our project with RIT, Rick Slattery, uh, highlighting adoption of BMPs. Obviously, you can go to the sustainability website uh, that we've got through the Pollution Prevention Institute. And Carl, we even shipped out a poster that you were kind enough to post with a picture for and take us through the BMP tip of the week. Yeah, so, you know, as we've been waking our way through this poster uh, during our show this week, uh, this year, Frank, uh, you know, we've, we've gotten a little bit on the nutrient management side, but today I wanted to highlight uh, one of the things, one of our eagle um, sort of practices here is, is measuring clipping volume. Uh, the greens are the most intense uh, management area on golf courses, and it makes sense to be really precise and accurate about when we're applying fertilizer, why we're doing that. Uh, and clipping volume is an easy way to do it. We just wrote a little uh, article in the GCSA NY newsletter about it. Um, I'll put the link to uh, below the video here to our live audience if you want to check it out. But clipping volume is really easy. You just dump the grass that you measure, uh, that you mow off on greens, you just dump it into a bucket and you keep that number. Um, and some data here for our folks uh, watching. This is from the Robert Trent Jones golf course, their fifth green. Uh, the first year that, that the superintendent Dave Hicks started collecting clipping volume is this orange line. 
Uh, and you can see there's some big swings in here, right? So big swings in growth. Uh, that was happening a lot um, that year because we had some big heavy rainfall events one after the other. And you would see growth spikes after that. And, and as you all would imagine, growth spikes lead to uh, less than ideal playing conditions, slow, wet surfaces. Uh, and if we go really quickly back there, Frank, to the blue line is the 2019 data. After Dave had kind of a year under his belt of looking at that growth data, you can see that blue line's a lot more steady. There's a couple, there's a couple humps in there that just aren't controllable due to environmental conditions. But that gray zone, the sort of Goldilocks zone is what we're calling it, where he got good playing conditions, growth was very steady. And you can see in that second year and in the subsequent years after he's been able to keep um, his green services in that sort of uh, ideal zone a little bit more. Um, and this translates out to the playing conditions, right? So there is that link, a lot of superintendents noticing that link between how much their greens grow and how well their surfaces perform. Of course, we know the stimp meter. Uh, Chris Tritabal wrote a really nice article. Again, I'll post that in the description here. Uh, just talking about the stimp meter, and I know it's the bane of, of a lot of superintendents' existence, but if you use it for your own good, you can start to connect, okay, green speed with growth. And uh, growth is something we can tangibly try to affect, right? We have fertilizers, we have PGRs, uh, cultural practices, our mowing, rolling frequency. Uh, you know, green speeds, it's, it's a little bit harder to directly manage that. But because we have this link between green speeds and growth now that we're seeing, using this data, if it matters, measure. Um, we, can, we can come up with better green surfaces. And in Chris's case, he says, I don't have to put as much effort into it because I'm measuring these things. It's easier for me. So uh, that's our BMP tip of the day. Thanks, Carl. Love that stuff. And and one of the things, uh, another uh, news item is the the revisiting uh, of the uh, new of the normal temperatures. Every ten years, NOAA uh, revises normal. And so when we say relative to normal in our weather records here, here in, in, in our forecast website at Cornell, we usually use the 30 year average. So you're looking at 30 year average temperatures from the beginning of the 20th century to the end of the 20th century, uh, where you can see temperatures going up pretty high. And, and even in the last, uh, since 1981, the period between 81 and 2010 and 91 and 2020, you can see that we've continued to warm. So I do think not just measuring, uh, you know, not just paying attention to the fact that it's warming, but having the clippings there uh, as a measurement of how things are changing. You know, when Carl, when you say Chris isn't worrying about it, that's very telling. It's like data where many people worry about having data. In, in many cases, having this data can help you explain things even to yourself. Right and 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 makes it easier for you to manage these things. So let's get into the weather uh, as we see it nowadays. And and one of the things that we've noticed is we're in a bit of a stall. We were way ahead of normal for a period of time, and and except for balmy Buffalo, uh, we continue to be right at about normal relative to growing degree days. But the uh, temperature prognostication moving forward is more likely to be above normal uh, in the next couple of weeks. Now, again, we, you know, we, we, we always take these things a little bit at, you know, uh, you know with, with, with some skepticism about projecting out. We haven't always been as reliable, but it appears that the trends now for these above normal temperatures are, are going to be pretty solid. Um, and that's going to start to drive soil temperature. You'll notice we have soil temperatures still in the areas in the 40s at the two inch depth. And we were almost across the board well into the 50s and 60s uh, over the last couple of weeks. So just like last year, we hit a little bit of a stall pattern and it looks like we're about to break out of it. Now, on, on the rainfall front, you know, at least where I am, I got plenty. I don't really need any more where we are. I think maybe Buckley, Rich Buckley might have come and visit us here in central New York and central PA uh, over the last week because we got plenty of rain. Not everybody experienced that, but almost everybody got some. But we're expecting a dry period now uh, for the next couple of weeks anyway, moving forward. Now, Ben, as we start to talk about annual bluegrass weevil, I just want to remind you of this great work that you guys did a while ago that served as the basis for us to work with our state park guys uh, in our state park funded project over the years to especially the Beth Page guys, but really everybody talking to them about the way they apply and see damage and manage their annual bluegrass weevil. And I know you've you know done work at Beth Page and paid attention to some of the things that 
we've been able to do with Jennifer Grant over the years and Carl's keeping it up, scouting, record keeping, choosing the right materials and how that resulted in over a period of time, a, a significant reduction in, in environmental risk, uh, area treated and number of applications made per year. So that was really good that you did that publication with Albrecht a number of years ago. But recently it looks like you're bringing up some stuff that you might have done either at Delhi or not long after you uh, got to Delhi, Ben. And I want to bring you on here for a minute. I'm going to make, make it so everybody can see. I want to keep the slides up because I want to talk to you a little bit about emergence now, pal. This is what you saw back then. I, I pulled these two out of the publication, one a two peak, one a one peak, right? You talk about multi volt, you know, uh, multi uh, germ, you know, voltine, multi voltine. Love that word. Going to try to get it. that in Scrabble somewhere. See if I can get that into the Scrabble tournament. So talk a little bit about how how much you like this trend of tracking degree days as a good way of scouting. Or if you don't, uh, tell me why, you know, it's maybe not a good way to go, but we, talk to us a little bit about emergence because it looks like we're in the teeth of it now. Yeah, I would expect that you would be. And I do talk to quite a few turfgrass managers in upstate New York on a weekly basis and, and what they're seeing and what we're seeing. Um, you know, this is a paper that I did do at Delhi, and then we finished up some stuff later on to um, cap it all off. But, uh, you know, the first thing that I want to talk about in relation to this work is growing degree day calculations. Um, so part of, you know, Syngenta's Weevil track is that we have researchers across the Northeast who contribute data. And, you know, since that time, you know, since the, I guess it was right around that 2011 time, um, I, I didn't really do Weevil track until I came to Penn State in 2014. But before that time, we were all using a standard uh, growing degree day monitor, the spectrum technologies monitor. And so right immediately, whenever I show a slide like this, people will put these numbers down and think that these are concrete things. And I do want to mention right out of the gate, like this is the instrument that we used and the method that is being used to calculate these growing degree days is a simplified sine method. So like a sine function, which accounts for you know, number of hours above a certain threshold and numbers below. Uh, if you were to just get your weather station at an airport, they give you a max and min and you freehand calculated that, these numbers would be drastically different. Drastically uh, different. Drastic. I think so. I think so. Okay. Uh, especially in the spring, uh, when we need these data to mean something. Uh, so often, you know, people contact me through Twitter or call me and, and say, you know, I'm at 350 growing degree days and it, it doesn't really make a whole lot of sense. So there are some limitations to these data. Uh, I wish it wasn't the case. I wish it was like, you know, these numbers were the numbers, but. Okay. Uh, All right. Well, listen, that's good. I, yeah. <laughs> I, I think it's good. I think it's good to clarify. So, because a lot of people, as we onboard more people to data-driven stuff, Ben, it's important to tell them that not all data is, is as clean as a baby's butt, right? It's not, it's not all really clean, right? There's a lot of it that just needs a lot of cleansing. And, and so I think more importantly, the question is, you like tracking the degree days is one component, but I'm interested in the pattern of behavior here because that's where I'm going to I just let you know. Where I'm going to is maybe the shifting that we're getting to, Ben, in monitoring uh, adults. And then the way you dissected these things, looked at eggs, the way you looked at new food in their gut. And you know the questions for today, and we can go back and forth with the slides and we can just look at each other. But you know, my, my question is, you know, I really think that insecticide resistance is building. And I'm wondering if you think that's part of what's motivated you lately to understand this larval strategy a little bit more. Uh, are we going to get new products? And I guess let's start, you know, where we're at this year, right? So let, let's start with okay. the stuff. Where are we at this year? And then uh, we'll talk about sort of in general uh, how the paper went. Okay. So where we are this year, very weird year. I know you guys are really good about the updates of weather. And that is exactly what we saw. Uh, so we start tracking growing degree days, and I do like growing degree days, and we have a 
extensive data set for many of our sites. Uh, I think we've done some larval extractions that are better that make our models better here at Penn State. So this year I would have bet money that I could have in my remote office pull the trigger for different applications around the, around the region. And uh, you know we had built this great data set. The R square value was awesome. Uh, you know, so it explained the data beautifully, and then absolutely shit the bed <laughs> as far as the models breaking down. So like where I was like, oh man, we got to publish this. It's like all of a sudden I couldn't explain it mostly from the adults. So we start tracking uh, March 1st, you know, that's an arbitrary number. Uh, we did do some things on campus where we bought some in-ground sensors that we could access remotely. And we started those back in December at the solstice. You know, just to see if we were missing anything. And I think, like, as you move south, you know, obviously you could have insects emerging before March 1st. Right. What we saw this year is we had a very dry and very warm early March. And so, just like all the beer that I like to drink, there might be empty calories, there might be empty growing degree days in there as well. And so, I think what happened in those first two weeks of March, we were accumulating these growing degree days but it might not have been the sole explanation about why things move and develop. Um, you know, these things happen at regular times every year. You know, if we had a model with temperature and maybe day length, um, maybe that okay. would smooth things out. Maybe there's a moisture component, we don't know. But our models are very, very simple and they're based on temperature. In spring is where we're gonna see all our variability. Yeah. Um, so we have, you know, larval models as well. And all of a sudden, because of this cool down, I think we're starting to align back with the model. So what we're seeing, here, you know, we started picking up um, first and second instars at our Columbus, Ohio site, all the way to Harrisburg last week. Uh, it's about 30 growing degree days above what the model would predict, but 30 growing degree days could be too relatively warm days okay so so you've already made the transition to talking about larvae because further yeah. south where this pest has traveled obviously it's 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 further it's further advanced but again to remind everybody the goal with tracking these adults is to lower the population so they can't breed correct and cr drop eggs that overwhelms our ability to maybe try to get him as larvae. And we'll get to try to control the second generation later on in the show. But for yeah. now, let's just stay there. Okay. How much longer, how much longer do you see, I mean, adult aside strategies still remain the cornerstone, or I know you've warned me about this in the past, going to a larval only strategy. So talk to me about where you still sit on the value of trying to time at peak emergence to drop that number. Yeah, I mean, I think it's it's a big part of the programs. I, I consult with multiple golf courses throughout the region. Uh, and all of those properties, um, we do put out an adult aside. It is a, the only time of the year where you're going to have one stage present. It's above ground. It's susceptible. You can do things where you can get control. However, control is not perfect. What we're looking to do is just take a chunk out of the population. And we're also trying to really reduce that egg laying window. So in that study that you referenced, we tracked individuals over a couple of years, you know, like same male and female in their little, uh, little POA prison. And we would move them each week and I'd count the eggs. So that's what I was doing all this morning before the show. Uh, and those individuals, we had females that would live 15 weeks. So like if you're talking uh, uh, in upstate New York, an April 1st emergence, they could be laying eggs all the way into July if you could keep them alive. They have, they have the potential to do that. So, so will they lay, I mean, th so does that necessarily mean with their ability to do that, if you don't lower their numbers, that there's you're just going to be overwhelmed constantly with larval lar, lar, and then and then yeah. that of course begs the question is it the same thing with larvae that you're just taking a chunk out you're not you know cleaning house yeah so they're going to naturally get un asynchronous or unsynchronized uh in the summer populations and i do think that you know the majority if you look at that paper the majority of eggs are laid between five and eight weeks and in, in confinement 
Uh, are adults living that long out in the wild? They're probably getting picked off by other insects or birds or getting hit by mowers. Uh, so that might, that's like a best case scenario to some degree. However, even if we take the conservative side and go eight weeks of egg laying, they're laying eggs all through May and into June if they're not being controlled. And you're just leading to the jumbled stages much earlier in the year, which is impossible to control with any chemical strategy. Okay. Uh, so what we're trying to do is reduce that egg laying window, but also synchronize the future larval population. So again, in the courses that I consult with, uh, we're, we're following that adulticide with a larvicide after that. They're not just. Is there, uh, is, is there, is there evidence, Ben, that do you know the size of the chunk you get? Do you know the size of the chunk that you need to get, you know, I mean, we never talk thresholds with AB. I've never heard a word about thresholds with these things, but when we start talking about the way we're doing this now, you know, obviously that's my first question. Let's start there. Do we, do we know how much we have to reduce it? And is, are we just making sure we're hitting it at the peak? Do you tell guys to keep tracking after they spray to see what happens to numbers? Let's talk a little bit about that for a second. And then, and then we're going to get to life without chlorpyrifos. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I mean, ideally, um, you know, if I were each population, is like a snowflake and because of pyrethroid resistance and, and you said, you think that it's, it's becoming more and more a problem. I think it's already there. I would say, uh, you know, I think we have some evidence from my graduate student that Betts page is actually getting better from laying off of it that, uh, he, he's looking at some microbiome stuff, which is a story for another time, and, and we're seeing some changes in the microbiome. So uh, there's some interesting things that we have to stay tuned for, but I think we've already maxed out um, with pyrethroid resistance. I think there's a lot of places in the metropolitan New York area uh, that are dealing with, you know, three decades of pyrethroid use, uh, and they don't think that they have a problem. Uh, but when we test them, and I, you know, we just had a test last week, and it was like, wow, these are these are pretty tolerant. Um, so that chunk might be as little as 25 to 30%. Um, but in that paper with the two peaks in some years, um, that could be just what we're seeing this year with a warm up. They come out, but not all of them have emerged. And we get that cool down, and then there's another emergence. So that can affect things as well. That's why it's hard to say the adulticide being the cornerstone because it's really a, a one two punch. Um, and both of them are important. Uh, I think we've got some great products for larvicides. However, you know, to just rely on larvicides, it, it's not something that I would recommend if somebody's hosting a big event or wants to keep their job in high. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> okay. so so let's get to uh, resistance, right? Uh, pyrethroid resistance. We've maybe maxed out, maybe it's improving. If you lay off of it, that's a, certainly a message about rotation and, and that sort of thing. But you'd think that'd be a message for that. Uh, I'm wondering about, you know, products that are on the market now that can work as adulticides, or you see them maybe having a role as larvicides, but we've never thought of them as such. And of course, I'm thinking about a celebrant because a lot of guys are going out for grub control in the next couple of weeks, and maybe there's a twofer there. What do you, what do you think about these sort of not traditional materials for adulticides to use them in that strategy? Yeah, I mean, I think you're alluding to our work with uh, Civitas, and we're hopefully going to get those papers out. Uh, it's off of my plate. My co-authors have to step up to play all their cup and offer. <laughs> uh, but, uh, you know, we've looked at those products. We've looked at surfactants. We've done a lot of work with surfactants um, this spring. Um, you know, all of the surfactants that we test have some sort of um, lethal action against uh, these insects. Uh, if you think about uh, combining these things with some traditional products. So we, we have some studies uh, where we've already pulled off the data from early collections of adults with looking at surfactants in combination with pyrethroids against pyrethroid resistant populations, surfactants and chlorpyrifos against some pretty resistant populations. And we see some really dynamite combinations with insecticides, but all of them, well, not all of them, I'll say a good deal of them uh, will provide some level of mortality if you can uh, spray the insect directly. So it could be a suffocation. In the case of Civitas, we know that it's kind of 
breaking down surface tension and kind of flooding them from the inside. But in the case of mixing it with a pyrethroid, um, you know, if you think about the outside of the insect, it's got a waxy cuticle, so it's you know, uh, hydrophobic to begin with. What we think is happening, there's plenty of evidence in the literature about using pyrethroids with surfactants against resistant populations that it allows for better delivery into the insect. So some of these insects that develop um, uh, physiological resistance, they have thicker cuticles and stuff like that. Uh, we really don't know, uh, despite what entomologists will tell you, we really don't know what drives resistance in these insects. Uh, I mean, there were some studies uh, where they apply certain things and make the assumption that it's enzymes, and it does, you know, there's a good possibility that it could be enzyme dr driven. Mm -hmm. However, these in, these populations don't mix much, so to say that there's only one uh, mode of resistance is, is kind of a leap. And what so, we're so yeah, so thanks for bringing up modes of action, modes of resistance, because I'm wondering, are there, you know. <laughs> We suffer in the weed world from the lack of new chemistries and, and modes of action and, and weeds are going to continue. You know, Matt Elmore was on here a couple of weeks ago and was saying you got to be creative. Weeds are starting to figure out ways around our pre-emergent crabgrass control and you got new weeds causing problems. Are there new chemistries on the horizon for ABW that, that maybe are being developed that we're not seeing in the, in the weed world? Yeah, I think, um, Ironically, we, I think with the loss of chlorpyrifos is a big one for ABW in New York, still everywhere else in the world. Uh, and, you know, the popular, the, again, the courses I consult with, I'd say we're probably mostly using chlorpyrifos for that adulticide spray. Doesn't feel great to recommend it. It's probably something we shouldn't be using, but it's highly efficacious even against these uh, populations. So we can make it work really well. Yeah, we can, uh, I don't like recommending it. Uh, however, I, I do think this is the last year that I will be recommending it because there are new products coming on board. Um, so I guess I'm free to speak about this now, but there is going to be a new product that we were trying to get in your hands down at the Beth Page place that is about the most exciting thing I've seen in my career. Oh, okay. um, it's it's going to be an insect growth regulator um, from CSI or QualiPro or Adama. They're all kind of intertwined, but uh, I think QualiPro is the, the company that will be the face to the superintendent. Um, what we see is pretty amazing activity against larvae. It's a growth regulator, so it inhibits molting. So if you apply it against a larva, it's not gonna make it to the next uh, instar. We've looked at it when they're in the plant, out of the plant, dynamite control with one application per year. But the, what makes it the most exciting thing that I think I've seen in my career is what it does to the adults. And, um, you know, just coming back from the lab and we've looked at this for a couple of years, we're gonna get a paper out this later this year on this. When we apply it against the adults, it affects their ability to lay eggs, which is like my number one wish list is if you could control something, it, it, none of our products control eggs. So if you can control the thing that doesn't lay eggs, you know, it, it's good. Now, there may be some problems with its lack of um, selectivity. You know, if it's going to be a molting inhibitor, that could have it, you know, I, we're going to look at that as well. You know, we want to cover all our bases, but uh, the good thing about ABW is it's the dominant insect out there, golf courses, where we have ABW problems. So uh, there might be a few things that get caught in the crosshairs, but very low toxicity. I think, Carl, you looked that up for your, your work at Beth Page, and it, that's Pretty exciting uh, stuff. Excellent. The heels of that, I think we've got a couple more products that I can't talk about right now that are coming down the pipeline as well. So we don't have a whole lot of products in the insect world. Yeah, Very few classes. You go to Canada, you give a talk in Canada, I reduce 75% of what we have here. Yeah. And then I'm about to get on a call with the UK after this. And they've got one insecticide. They only have a celebrant. Well, and and the whole neonic, uh, the whole neonic concern, of course, the banning of chlorpyrifos in New York State uh, is is uh, manifested of that. So, Carl, we are at the ten thirty hour. You know, we could go on for a while. Are there any questions or comments from you or the crew? Yeah, I think one thing I'd ask you, Ben, is um, you know, with ABW, it seems like chemical control really is is our only option, short of changing grasses, right? Annual bluegrass, if, if you get the poa out of there, 
Uh, are there any other non-chemical uh, control methods for people who maybe don't have the budget to spray their fairways who are getting hammered? Um, yeah, I mean, I think uh, there? I do think like um, the POA uh, selectivity is, is an issue that I'd like to address. And, and I have a PhD students working on the bent grass problem. So it very readily attacks bent grass. We're throwing it on Bermuda. We're throwing it on rye. Uh, I think the, the insect is going to want to survive when it moves into these new areas and we see it do just fine in bent grass. Mm. Um, so I think there were some recent studies from my little laboratory where they were trying to use it as a selective tool. Uh, I, I, I'm going to just respectfully <laughs> disagree. <with. laughs> okay. Yeah. 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 Because yeah, that is something I think um, uh, uh, Matt Elmore had a grad student working on yeah. it. Uh, yep. for selectivity. Um, and I, I think that's a very interesting approach. We've seen it work a little bit in places at Beth Page, but as you said, and in the mid Atlantic and ask the guys down there, they're eating the, you know, Stan Zontek saw me eating the bent grass 10, 15 years ago was talking 20, about this. 20 right? or more. Right. Yeah. Right. So we've known about that for a long time. And um, yeah, I think you have a higher safety net. I mean, we did those papers back in the early two thousands at Rutgers. So um yeah uh, <laughs> hey it's 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 worth looking at but uh i don't think of that as really a viable opportunity i mean i i do think it does give you a higher safety net i don't think it's going to eliminate it uh and maybe that's all you need i mean that's we right. just need to play defense against damage that's right um you know our cultural practices that we've looked at nitrogen doesn't have an impact on this insect uh it's, you know we have an its paper coming out on that um rolling and mowing and brushing all of those things have uh impact on them and, and it can be a significant impact but that's really only going to reduce the load on uh greens so yeah. you're not going to go out you know and and the heights that we're mowing even at collars doesn't really remove any of these insects either so uh you know i did my phd on nematodes and, and they're highly effective but i don't know a single course who's using my research there so well yeah and and listen carl if there's no questions that is a perfect way to end because i do think we're seeing the same issues with um we're seeing the same issues with with any place we're trying to use nematodes where school districts you know are having grub problems but the community's getting tired of the routine exemptions for even something like a celeprin the 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 resistance in new york state ben uh to pesticide use uh, continues to grow at a more rapid rate than insect resistant does uh, to the pesticide. So thanks for taking the time to join us, Carl. We, we don't want to bend the space time continuum too much. We're at the 30 minute thing. It's so great to see you, Ben. Thanks for taking the time. Yeah, Alan. Thanks for having me. Right. I agree thanks, with Vitas. Alan's <laughs> coffee brandy for everyone. Yeah, that's yeah right. Vitas, another, another classic comment there. Um, uh, thanks everyone for joining us. We'll be back tomorrow. Uh, Grady Miller, we'll have him on to talk about mower performance stuff he's uh, researched in the past, so don't miss that. Uh, until then, we'll see you guys later. This has been a production of Cornell University, on the web at cornell.edu.